Hey everyone. Maybe we'll give maybe we'll give a couple more minutes for some stragglers to show up. But um yeah, I'll maybe I'll do a little introduction of myself um before we get into the actual lecture bit of this. Um let me see. I'm going to look through this waiting room. There's some people in here that I recognize. So hello to y'all if we've met before. Um and then there is a lot of people in here who I've never met before. So my name is Danny. Um, I'm a music producer, instrumentalist, audio engineer, DJ. Um, Justin is like a really, really good friend of mine. We've known each other since seventh grade. We were like 13 years old. Started producing music at around the same time. Um, worked together quite extensively. So we worked on um, when there was a Fantastic Voyage like live band. We used to tour that together and I've worked on a bunch of his records with him. Um, outside of working with Justin, I produce and engineer for a living. So I work with a lot of different artists and songwriters and rappers and film composers and all manner of different kinds of musicians helping people like bring their recordings to life. Um, and yeah, it takes a variety of forms. Sometimes I'm like beat maker. Sometimes I'm like a synth sound designer person. Sometimes I'm programming drums. Um, and that is what we are here to talk about today is drum stuff. So first of all, did everyone uh, enjoy the the first lecture yesterday, the 909 intro kind of thing? Thumbs up. You can you can say stuff in the chat, you know, whatever, whatever feels comfortable for you guys. Um, good. And yeah, has anybody had any time since yesterday to kind of like mess around with some of the stuff that Justin was showing? Great. Amazing. I love that. Um, yeah, he has such a brilliant way of uh, trying to get people sort of from A to Z, like very quickly and boiling something that can seem very complicated down into like a relatively simple set of principles, um, which is so, I think, essential for creativity and music making generally. And today, my hope is that um, we're going to expand on some of those ideas a little bit and just dive in like a little bit further with um, how to finesse some of the drum programming a little bit more. Um, I, I even feel like the word programming makes it sound like more complicated than what it is. and my hope is that I'm going to be focusing on like musical concepts more than I'm going to be focusing on Ableton related stuff or audio related stuff or whatever. Like there will be a little bit of that for people who are interested and definitely um, please like drop questions in the chat if there's any Ableton or technical related things that you are confused about. I'm sure there are other people here who can help answer some of those questions um as we're going but um mostly what i want to focus on is like compositional musical related stuff so i think much more important is what you're hearing and listening to um and trying to be able to like internalize some of those musical ideas more so than the ableton stuff does that kind of make sense to everybody great um I think the way that I'm going to try to structure this is there's like a few little sections of um, different kinds of information that I want to get through. Um, I will try to pause for like a brief round of questions after each one. Um, hopefully we don't have too many questions after each little section because I'm hoping that each one is very bite sized and like digestible and then towards the end of the whole thing, we can do like a longer Q&A. My hope is that this will take 90 minutes to two hours. I'm going to try to make sure that I can get through everything that I want to just talk about in about an hour or an hour and a half. And we can do like 30 minutes of Q&A at the end. And then everyone can enjoy the rest of their holiday weekends or actually rather enjoy it by making some music and then pull up to the <laughs> workshop tomorrow with a bunch more tracks. But um, yeah, okay, cool. Is this uh, sounding all right to everybody? 
Okay, sweet. There's already so much happening in the chat, which I love. Um, let me just make sure I'm not missing everything. Everyone's going thumbs up, thumbs up, hang loose, thumbs up, thumbs up, hang loose. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, I think I think we're ready to get into it. Let's uh let's go ahead. I'm gonna share my screen and sound. And there we go. Can everybody see it? Thumbs up. Cool. All right. Let me make sure I'm actually sending the audio out to you guys. Cool. Um, all right. So the first thing that I would like to talk about is the idea of call and response. And I'm going to talk about this as it relates to drums. So I think um, call and response is just like a really fundamental musical concept it's one of the things that i think in like our primal ancient human state is like maybe the bridge between like music and language you know it's the thing that makes music sound like there's like a conversational element happening where there's different things that have a chance to say something and then something else that maybe responds to it you know, so and so. And there's so many like musical traditions around the world that are almost like entirely rooted in these ideas of call and response. Like, for example, like gospel music, like African American gospel is so like there's the preacher who calls out and the choir or the congregation that will respond. Yeah. Many like Afro Latin musical traditions are very based on these ideas of call and response. And um, I want to show the way that. Uh, I think about some of that stuff where it relates to rhythm. So I have a 909 pulled up on this track right here, which, you know, uh, per the theme of the weekend, we're, we're going to be restricting ourselves to 909 related stuff. And I'm just going to put for the floor down real quick and loop that for four bars. And I'm going to play it and everybody let me know that you can hear it. Good. Cool. It's coming through. All right, cool. So let's, uh, let me just pluck in a simple rhythm real quick on this rim shot. And it's just going to loop every bar. It's cool. Simple. It's a cool, it's a cool rhythm already. Like it's like we could get off to the races and start running with something like this. But for me, I feel like when it's just looping over and over like this again, it's saying something and nothing is talking back to it. That's that's kind of like where my mind goes. It's like I feel like I want something to be altered about this somewhat. So what I'm going to do is there's this little button down here that says duplicate. It might be in a different place for you if you're on Ableton 12, but the button still exists. Um, so I'm going to press duplicate. And it's going to take that one bar pattern that I made and it's going to make it two bars, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to slightly alter this rim shot pattern at the end. So maybe I'll like move this one forward and maybe I'll like take this one out and let's see what we have now. Okay, cool. So maybe I'll take this one out you know, whatever, it doesn't, in essence, it kind of doesn't really matter what we do in the second one. The idea for me here is that now we have an expectation sort of that's set up by that first measure, doom, doom, but, 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 and the second measure kind of like fills in our little answer to that question that was posed in the first measure. So the first measure, doom, doom, but, 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 right? Make sense to everybody? It's very simple, but this is one way that you can take, you know, we have a, we have a basis from the kick drum that is super repetitive, every beat just pounding away, right? So we have a foundation that's extremely solid, and now we can have this thing that's having a conversation with itself on top of it, right? Make sense? And to me, this is a much more like musically compelling idea than the one beat loop was where we just had this repeating. Loop. Right. So 
it kind of some of this stuff is stylistic like i think if you're making like techno techno capital t like your loop ideas will be probably a little shorter maybe these two bar phrases aren't going to be exactly what you'll go for but i think some of the ideas of call and response still persist um i also want to point out that um if i undo and we go back to this one bar loop the call and response doesn't have to just be one, two, one, two, like A, B, A, B. It could be like A, 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 B. Like here, let me show you what I mean. So if I hit duplicate twice, now you see at the bottom here, my piano roll, we have one measure, two measure, three measure, four measures, right? Stretch it out into this four bar pattern. What I'll do is I'll let this pattern of rim shots repeat three times and then maybe this fourth one we'll do something a little different here so like this and then we'll make some of these really quiet whatever whatever cool so like this still a call and response to me, the call is set up by the three repeats of where it's like the answer now is happening the fourth time around, but still kind of breaking up this phrase so it's like a little less loopy and feels a little more conversational. Make sense, everybody? Please excuse my like horrible beatbox it's not even beatboxing whatever we're going to call that vocalizing of these drum sounds but um i find it to to be actually incredibly useful in a way that i'm going to talk about a little bit more deeply in a second but um does that make sense to everybody by the way so you know this um this four bar phrase could be like this instead it could be a a b a for example it could be a b a c right like you could it uh you know if this da, 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 represents the a then right now we have a a b a will still work you know in the idea of a call and response right um so there's a lot of different ways that you can approach this but this is just one of the ways that i think about like taking very simple sort of repetitive drum patterns and making them more conversational and more like interesting over time make sense let me check the chat because it's popping. I'm not used to this like absolute insane pace of, of messaging while I'm talking. Um, let's see. Vocoder. Huh. Uh, older version. Ableton should have the 909 core. Yeah. Yes, true. Homework submissions. Uh, da, 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 da. This is the core kit that comes stock. Yes, it is. Uh, did Justin get a haircut and a tan? Probably. Um, uh, okay, cool. People are answering each other's questions. That's great. All right, sweet. Anybody have any? Oh, how did I make some of the rim shots quieter? Um, there is a parameter right here that's called velocity at the bottom of uh, my uh, piano roll right here. So this, this window is called a piano roll because you can see the notes of the keyboard and we're rolling through it. Whenever I select one of these notes, there's this little uh, flag right below it. And if I slide this up and down, it's gonna make that note louder or quieter, right? Make sense? Everybody good with that? We're gonna talk a little bit more deeply about velocity in a second. I actually didn't even intend to show that at first, but I was feeling myself. Um, okay, cool. Uh, anybody, any questions about the sort of like really basic idea of call and response for now? We all good on that? Seeing some thumbs up. It's really hard for me to see like all of you also. So, okay. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Good. All right. Cool. Um, yeah. And if anybody has questions, drop them in the chat and or save them for later for the, you know, Q&A if anything else comes up as we're going. All right. Next, um, I'm going to delete this. Actually, I'm going to start over and um, I'm going to expand upon this idea of call and response to introduce uh, pitched variations right high and low um so let's start with for the floor again 
And um, this is something that you guys did. I'm pretty sure Justin would have showed you how he likes to use or how in dance music it is used often. Uh, the kick drum and the toms in the 99 kit to make these like bouncing, rolling bass patterns, right? Um, so I'll start on one real quick with the low tom, just kind of bouncing off of the kick drum here like this and click on the low tom. Okay, this already too bad. Cool. Simple, bouncy, two beat loop, right? So maybe what I'll do is I'll put a higher one right here. Cool. So how would we introduce some call and response into this? Well, to me, we have maybe potentially an expectation set up as soon as we have the mid tom and the low tom playing off each other. So we don't So maybe if I duplicate this and I alter that or add to it in the second time around, we can kind of reply to that expectation a little bit, right? So maybe I'll go. Kind of like that. That's cool. Okay, so what's the expectation that's being set up is from this right here. How are we responding it to it? So traditionally, with ideas of call and response, like if you think about the 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 name of this thing that I'm talking about over and over. It, it comes from like people's voices, right? Like one person says something and maybe a chorus of, chorus of people like would sing a line in reply. So I guess what I'm trying to introduce here is that the idea of call and response can be both rhythmic, like what we were doing with the rim shot earlier with this sound, right? Where we were setting up a rhythmic expectation and then sort of subverting it or answering that expectation later with the same sound on a different rhythm. But what you could also do is you could set up an expectation with one sound and respond to it with another one, right? So we could go like this, like here, let me just go back to the simple Tom thing. So I could do like, and then maybe I'll do a bunch of rim shots here. And then, so like, this is going to be my call. This is going to be my response. Let's see how this sounds. See how this is working? These two elements, now it's like the snare and the rim shot are in conversation with each other, right? We having this sort of conversation of there's almost like this pitched high and low variance between like if I was going to sort of sing the snare, I would probably sing it maybe a little higher and I would sing the rim shot a little lower, something like that. So, um, you know, I do want to talk about this for a second that I actually all the time am like singing my drum parts, obviously, as you can tell from me just doing this right now. I'm not like a talented beatboxer. This is not me trying to say that <laughs> I'm not a good vocalist either. Like I'm, my voice isn't an amazing instrument. However, I think that when drums have good call and response and when there is a good interplay between high elements and low elements, it almost creates this melody that you should be able to sing monophonically with your mouth. To me, that's one of the things that makes a groove like really interesting and good. So it could be like right? Because there's this interplay between some hits that are up high, da da, some hits that are moving down, do 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 do. And they're sort of responding to each other in a way where 
they're not like overlapping. They, one thing has a chance to say its thing. Another thing has a chance to say its thing later, which is why I can sort of sing it in this like linear fashion with my mouth, which is purely monophonic. Does that kind of make sense to everybody? And I, I find this to be super useful when I'm just writing my drum parts. I'll be like, how do I want this group to bounce? And I'll just sort of sing it to myself. And if I can sing something that sounds interesting and compelling, then I just figure out like, okay, well, what sounds in my kit that I'm working with correspond to those different noises that I was just making with my mouth, right? And like here, I'll show you guys a song that I was listening to earlier today that I think like has a really great example of like a very singable call and response thing in the drums, high and low. So try to listen for it. It's right in the beginning of the song. So I hear three sounds really, right? There's a kick drum, there's one kind of rim shot, and then there's another rim shot that's like, or like maybe it's like a bongo even, that's like really tonal, right? So they're kind of playing off each other by going like boom, clap, boom, clap, blump, clap, boom, clap, blump, clap, boom, clap, blump, clap, boom, blump, blump, clap, boom, clap, blump, clap, boom, blump, blump. Please excuse my silly vocalizations, but try and see if you can hear that now in this drum beat. Like to me, it's so simple, but that's like what makes these drums really compelling and interesting is because it has this almost like singable interaction between these three elements that makes it like bounce and move like that, you know, plus the sounds are really cool, but like that's, that's for another time. Um, Makes sense to everybody, these ideas of like melody and drums and how like high and low can be part of your call and response patterns and this idea of being able to sort of like sing a drum beat that uh, has those things baked into it. Is that, is that working for y'all? Sorry, I'm struggling to like minimize and then expand the zoom window so I can see everybody, but okay, I'm mostly seeing thumbs up. Um, catch up on the chat scat man <laughs> calling out for scat man's world um vocalizing for drum ideas makes great sense practical yeah definitely 3024 hell yeah um yep 100 <laughs> percent martin yeah martin is martin is the best um he is um yeah one of my one of my mentors um, amazing, amazing, incredible producer, just a great dude. Um, is there a rule of thumb for choosing sounds in call and response, e.g. low versus high, long versus short? You know, no, not that I can think of. Um, that's a really good question. I feel like, I think that's kind of, I would just say like, that's up to your intuition, right? Like if you are hearing something that's long short 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 long short, short short like just make it like that you know if you're hearing something that's low to high high to low like it's really kind of up to you like whatever you think sounds good in your track my only advice with that would be keep things really simple like notice how with most of my ideas or in that martin track that i played or whatever we started with something incredibly simple right and then we sort of expanded upon it from there. So I think that that is like my favorite approach to just doing drums in general. Like here, I'll take some of this stuff out for a second. Like, let's go back to this idea of this tom pattern. And let's also, let's just make it one bar again. So I'm gonna crop it, so it's just one bar. Cool, so we have this looped kick and tom thing that's happening. Um, Right. So we're starting with something that's like literally dumb, simple, and then I'm going to duplicate it. And then maybe we'll make some changes or sorry, if we started with this. Duplicate it, then I'm going to make some changes to like the second half, right?
So it keeps it sort of related to the original idea that we had because we're just sort of like duplicating it, sliding it over, making some slight alterations, right? Like, I don't think that I'm trying to like reinvent the wheel every time I'm creating a response to something that I set up. Does that make sense? I'm just like duplicating it and altering it slightly. And you can keep going on this like generally as like an arrangement technique. Like if you have a four bar loop that works really well, like duplicate it and make a slight change to it at the end or the beginning of the next four bars and then you have an eight bar loop. And then like duplicate it again and make something slightly different happen in the next eight bars and now you have a 16 bar loop. And then pretty soon you have two to three minutes worth of music that's like all related to itself. Nothing sounds too random, nothing sounds too different, but you know, you've incorporated these ideas of sort of like expectation and subversion on a longer and longer and longer time scale as you go. Make sense? Um, yeah, that was such a like tangential response to a very simple question. I hope I, <laughs> hope I answered that. Okay, wait, how many elements within the track you'd want to have a call and response on when it becomes too much? Again, personal taste. Um, I would say just a couple, really. Although to me, so firstly, I should say um, making dance music, I think is a, is a, balance of finding things that are very repetitive and then things that are changing you know changing slightly or changing a lot it kind of depends on what we're talking about but i feel like uh dance tracks need to be centered around things that are repetitive because that's what gives them the um the meditative sort of trance-like thing that happens with dance music and certain things need to be changing on top of it so that you have enough interest for the track to not feel too boring when you want it to be, you know, four to five minutes long, whatever. So I think which elements you have calling and responding to each other is kind of up to you. Like in the case of drums, I probably wouldn't have more than two, you know, different things, maybe three different things sort of playing off of each other. Less is definitely more, but I also, just to expand upon this a little bit for a second, call and response can be happening between like a vocal and a chord and a drum, right? Or like a vocal and a bass line can call and respond to each other. Or like the drums and a synth can call and respond. Like it doesn't need to be just purely limited to your drum set. And like, I'm always kind of looking to find little spaces in between some of my sounds to like put some of my other sounds not because I'm trying to fill every single space, but because I know that from an arrangement perspective, if like the vocal plays for a second and then it stops, that's probably a great place to put a little bit of action right there. You know what I mean? And then like when that action stops, then it's like a nice time to put the vocal again or a new idea or whatever it is. Does that kind of make sense? Like you can expand upon these call and response ideas to like not just be drums, but like your whole track ideally is kind of in a bit of a conversation with itself right like if you if you guys listen to james brown's music the whole band the whole rhythm the whole band is basically a rhythm section horns his vocals everything and it's all just like one funky call and response like that's what makes it really funky and that's why it works is because like the horns will hit and then the guitars will play and then the bass line will go and it's all just like rolling around on itself right so um hope that makes sense for that question close but variants sounds like old school lex to funk hey yeah it makes sense da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah noting my beatboxing all right cool okay um Funk music in general, yes, totally. And you have to remember that funk and disco and soul and like Afrobeat and all these things that were being made in the 70s and 80s were like the samples that became the basis of like house music at first anyways. So um, cool, okay. So um, I'm gonna move on to talk about another thing um, real quick. So let's just build off of this um this beat that i have here and i want to talk about um 
what I'm going to call sort of like accents and emphasis. And um, I'll show you what I mean with that. So we have this. Cool. So I'm going to start by putting hi hats down on eighth notes, right? And they're all the same volume, and it's probably not going to sound very good at first. It's going to sound like this. Sounds okay, you know, nothing wrong with it, really. But um, could it be funkier? That is the question to me. So, uh, I believe so. Um, I'll put a clap on two and four, just so we can get like the feel of a backbeat going on a little bit more. Um, it's gonna sound like this. Again, that's okay. But what happens if I take these hi-hats, every other one, and I make these ones way quieter. Then what's this going to feel like? Can you guys hear the way that that sort of like locked into a groove a little bit more? Suddenly the hat is going tat, 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 right? So that's like one kind of a beat that to me, I feel like is a little bit more reminiscent almost like of like how a rock drummer would play the hi hat or like disco kind of drummers. Well, some of them, or maybe like Michael Jackson, like think like Billy Jean, the beginning of Billy Jean. Set, tsht, set, tsht, set, tsht. Like the emphasis is on the quarter note. Ta, 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 set, ta, ta, ta. Like the every other one in between those main emphasized beats is like much quieter. Right? And that gives us a feel that's kind of like this. Okay, cool. We dig that. I'm going to undo. What happens if we reverse that? What happens if I make these ones a bit quieter or a lot quieter? That feels a lot more like house music to me um yeah kind of regular yeah it regular if you're listening to to a lot of for the floor dancey kind of tracks in fact to be honest with you most house and techno stuff probably doesn't even have these uh hi-hats on where the kick drum is hitting they would probably just be like this but the principle is sort of the same here right it's like where in the beat are we emphasizing in order to like create our groove. Does that kind of intuitively make sense to y'all? How differently these two things sort of feel where it's like, do we have the emphasis on the upbeat like this, like where the every other one is really loud? Or do we have the emphasis more on the downbeat where the ones that like line up with the kick drum, oops, are really loud. Right, totally different feel in my book. And like here, let me expand upon this idea even a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to make another little loop. Let's do something with a broken beat now. Let's go boom, clap, boom, boom, clap. Cool. Um, loop this section over here. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put fast 16th note hats going on, right? And all the same velocity for now. A little boring, a little annoying, honestly. I'm going to turn it down. OK, cool. So now what happens if we start to make some of these really quiet, some of these a bit louder? Some of these like real loud, you know, I don't know exactly how much variance I want to go for here, but let's start with something that sounds like that. And I'll loop this here. Can you guys hear the way that that hi-hat is now got a little bit more of a groove in it, right? 
You can see the darker colored ones are the, the ones with the louder velocity here. So if I put, uh, maybe I'll go back to float floor, why not? If I put these back in, and see how much more funky that is than if I, I just option drag that pattern to like, you know, bring it across. And like, if I just make these all the same volume again, turn them down a little bit. We'll go back and forth. So to me, one of those has a groove, the one on the left, and the other one is a bit more mechanical sounding, computerized, less funk, relentless. That's a good word. Yeah, great. Yeah, this isn't exactly swing, but it's close. It's like, it's kind of, it's starting to get towards some of those ideas. Um, and to me, I just think of this as like an accent pattern. And um, like where you're placing your emphasis right and this this doesn't have to only be true for uh when you're doing straight 16th notes like this is true of any kind of syncopated rhythm and in this context i mean syncopated as in like it doesn't straight line up with your let's say eighth note pattern so i'll, I'll kind of show you what i mean right now like you could have the most like kind of bare bones dumb stock house beat that I'm about to make right now in like two seconds. And you just toss like one little off beat in there and suddenly you've defined your groove considerably more to me. So here, let's just take this, we'll loop this around, make sure that this doesn't sound dumb as hell, even though I know it's going to at first, but. Okay, let's make this a little shorter. Maybe pitch the clap down a little bit. Maybe pitch the hat down a little bit. Cool. Sweet. Okay, so it's so simple, right? It just how do you pull up velocity settings? Oh, here, I'll show you to the bottom. Um, so uh this little arrow right here that like has the icon for these little velocity counters that's how you expand and collapse it um again might be a little different in ableton 12 i don't remember i'm working on my laptop right now which i only have 11 on but um cool okay so let's just talk about like an accent in the context of this pattern which is all just eighth notes and so simple but if i just put like one snare like right here suddenly that's like it's got a little <laughs> to the beat right <laughs> Right? If I duplicate that, and now maybe we make this a little different. This could even be done with just like one hi-hat. Like famously, I feel like there's so many house songs that I really fucking love where they just like literally just do this or something somewhere, right? That makes sense to y'all. It's just like giving, um, how do I explain this? Giving a little accent, 
to a pattern that would otherwise be extremely simple, right? You're giving a slight little emphasis and you really don't need that much to make it really funky and interesting all of a sudden. And oftentimes these simpler drum beats that don't have that much going on, but just have a little accent somewhere in there, just to define the groove like a little bit more are easier to write to, if that makes sense. Instead of cluttering it up with like a lot of drum sounds and percussion, if you're planning on adding more voices into your piece, chords and bass line and whatever, for me, sometimes it's easy to just start with like a really simple thing, but I don't want it to be completely grooveless. So I give it a little accent somewhere and then that's how we're, you know, kind of expanding on like the most dead stock simple version of this beat. Make sense? Does this work with UKG as well? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the way that those beats are programmed would be different or like the rhythms are slightly different, but similarly, like, I bet you could find a bunch of UKG songs. Like if it was like a two-step pattern or something, maybe they would just do something like this, like, oops, um, got this. Maybe we'll make this accent into like a rim instead. My sounds are like all wrong for like a garagey feel now. They're too like big and sloshy, but. Kind of starting to approximate the idea of a UKG beat, and I actually love that. Wow, yeah, now now you guys are okay. You, you're transitioning me into exactly where I wanted to go because now we get to talk about swing, um, which is so sick that you brought up Garage because, like, to me, the main reason why this two step beat feels wrong is because there's no swing on it. What <laughs> electro swing? <laughs> Damn it, Andy. <laughs> Uh, that's hilarious. Um, swing. Okay. Let's talk about what it is first, and then we'll talk about how I use it. Um, so for anyone who is unfamiliar, I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this clip that I made earlier that has this like barrage of 16th notes in it. I can make them all a little shorter so we can see them a little easier. And this is what I would call straight. Pitch this back up a little bit. Right, every note is evenly spaced with every other note. So now if we wanted to apply some swing to this, what that means is every other note that doesn't line up with our sort of strong stressed beats, which would be these two, so the ones that fall in between, here and here, here and here, here and here, here and here, we're actually gonna delay their timing a little bit. So I'll start with it very slightly. A little more. A lot now. And can you hear how, that, how different that sounds versus this does this uh you guys are you hearing this i think i first want to ask like are you hearing the differences between the swung sort of pattern and the really straight one right straight being like computer everything is like bang on super tight because they're all evenly spaced swing is intended to mimic the inconsistencies of a human player right and sort of like the way that people actually make groove that feels good because not every note is like perfectly evenly computer bang on space yeah yeah that was a really good 
like I don't even know what you call that, like a soul fetch typing that you just did, Connor. <laughs> um, yeah, nice. Uh, cool. Okay, so how do I use this? I don't usually use this by like taking sixteenth notes and swinging it like this. But if we go back to this like UKG beat right here, if I go in and I find all of my ones, all of my drum hits that don't land on the stressed beats, right? I can find them, so that'd be like this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And now if I just like delay their start, what do we get? Let me go, let me do this and do this so we can compare the two real quick and just go back and forth. So straight. And then swung. Can you guys hear that difference? How one has a little bit more like bounce to it. It's got a little bit more, I don't know, swing. I mean, it's got a little bit more stank. I don't know. It's so hard to like describe these these things when you're talking about groove because it's so personal the way that you feel it but like you know um who was it was it yosef was asking about garage and like to me yeah shuffle exactly so to me like this really swinging one immediately sounds more garagey because like that is like that style of music is like very 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 swung in general right versus like the straight beat sounds like i'm trying to approximate it but like not really totally getting it so okay that makes sense now let me show you guys the actual like or not the actual you can adjust notes by hand there's a much more practical way to do this swing stuff and i'll show you how um now that you actually know what it's doing um so if i go back to one of my beats over here that's very straight And I scroll into this tab right here that's called Grooves. Um, Ableton has very kindly pre-made a bunch of what they call groove templates for us. So you can see as I'm scrolling through this list, we're encountering ones that say sing, swing 16 52, swing 16 57. There's the other ones down here that say swing logic 16. There's other ones down here, some of my personal favorites that say swing MPC 3000 sixteenths, right? So what these are is these are little essentially MIDI files that you can take and you can drag it onto any of your clips in here that you've written. So if I take this and I drag it over here, it's added a little bit of swing. Let me do a slightly more extreme one so we can hear it. You guys hear the way that that's now bouncing differently than what it was before when it was really straight cool yeah but yeah you guys are hearing the differences so um this these groove files right because now it's going to be over here in this thing that's called a groove pool so here let me uh let me do a couple things real quick so if i switch this beat around somewhat so that um well here let me just add to this actually so i'll duplicate my my 909 track maybe i'll add an open hi-hat here cool and now maybe what i want to do is let's say i want that pattern there and then in the next few bars, I want the same pattern, but I want to add some closed hi hats to it to sort of pick up the rhythmic intensity of this. And maybe I'll alter the velocity of some of these, you know, whatever, whatever, something like that, sure. 
Maybe I'll take them and bring them all down a little bit. Okay, this sounds kind of weird and effed up to me, and I'll explain why. Because this one is still straight. Laser straight, no groove has been applied to it, right? This one has all that really nice swing on it. Together, they're sounding a little, it sounds like I'm like clanging a DJ mix a little bit, but, um, but very subtly and without having two tracks. Like it just, they're not lining up very well because the swing of the hi-hats isn't really matching the, the swing of the rest of it. So um, what I'm gonna do is I can take this groove that's now been sitting down here in my groove pool and I can drag it, that same one that we used to affect the first pattern, I can just drag it over here and that should line up perfectly. Cool, so now we have something here, let me make it build a little baby arrangement out of it. Now we have these three parts. Okay, cool. So what have we done? We've put all of these different ideas together now into something that has a bit of a musical progression. We have a call and response in our toms. Right? Slightly different on the first bar and the second bar. We have um, an accent pattern that's happening, sort of like with different velocities in these hi-hats, right? That are get accenting different parts of the rhythm so that not every beat is like the same volume, but it has a little bit of like tet, 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 tet going on, right? And then we've also added some swing to it. So now we have something that I think actually sounds kind of funky when we play it all together, right? It's like got a little bit of bounce to it. It makes me want to shake my head and it's not like totally feeling like dead stock drums, even though I've done nothing to the sound of the kit. Very little, right? I just took the Ableton Core stock 909 and I just applied some of the compositional techniques that we've been talking about, right? The actual, you know, musical songwriting bits, which is what I'm trying to lay down for you guys right now. Okay, this feels like a good time to pause for some questions. Let me just scroll the chat. Little incidentals, you added the sauce, the bomb. <laughs> Alexa, turn on groove pool. Hell yeah. Um, what criteria do you consider when choosing the right groove from the groove pool? Do you tweak the parameters like quantize velocity? Good question. Um, I think it depends for me. If I'm doing drums first and there is nothing else that's happening inside of the song, I'll just cho choose a groove that feels good to me. So like with these groove numbers right here i can even preview the file a little bit the lower the number is the less swung it is so check this out that like almost sounds straight with a slight hitch in it the more the higher the number super swung and you can even see how not evenly spaced these little clicks are right they're so close together so like i think for dancey stuff and especially like at faster tempos i don't usually go above like mid 60s tops like that would be very heavily swung however the world is your oyster choose whatever feels good to you i think when there are other elements in the track already then it becomes a little bit more like i'm trying to get the drum groove to like groove with the rest of the stuff Right. So if my vocal chop or my chord stab or bass line is like on the straighter side, I'm probably not going to choose like a really swing in drum groove. I'll probably choose like maybe a more subtle one and see if I can get that to work together. Does that, does that make sense? Oh, and as far as the parameters, the quantize and velocity, generally I will just leave those where they pull up and I'll alter the velocity by hand because that is like really important for me to like define 
the groove the way I want to feel it. However, um, again, use every available tool, like mess around with these, these things and, you know, add, add the velocity from the groove and see what happens, you know? Um, okay. Two questions for you, Danny. What do the numbers next to each group file mean? Okay, cool. I just talked about that. Thank you for reminding me to talk about that. How do you, and do you think about adjusting the timing percentage? Not really. I just pick one that I like. Sometimes what I do, not to make this too complicated, but sometimes what I do is I'll press this little button right here, which is going to commit the timing changes to the MIDI. So like this, right? Now you can actually see what it's doing. See how it shifted over the start time of every other note, sort of like what we talked about, but only the like not stressed notes, the upbeat 16th notes. Um, so sometimes I'll commit and then I'll adjust by hand, but I don't usually... This is because I, I actually started making music and logic when I was 13 and I had no idea what I was doing. And like, it took me like seven years before I found Ableton. I've been using Ableton for like 10 years now, but like still some of those old habits that I had from logic when I didn't know anything have stuck with me where I just do a lot of like manual adjusting of the MIDI until it sounds the way that I want. I would advise you to try it because it's going to give you a really like good sense of groove and how and why it works but also like you know there are things that make this so much easier now and i would also advise you to use those you know if you feel like it um this b reminds me of azalea banks 212 i don't know that track okay vibes watching a burbank burbank airport sick um <laughs> So if you swing the hats, is it important to also swing the baseline since so that they all match? Yeah, try both. Usually want it all swinging together. I totally agree with that. A pet peeve of mine is when this swing between different elements doesn't sound right together. I'm not saying that they all have to be the same, mind you. Like if a baseline is a little straighter and the drums are a little more swung, it might feel really good actually. And that's how you can get a lot of like interesting kind of push and pull in your music between your rhythm section. But like, I don't want to hear it clashing. That's all that I'm really looking out for. It's like, and that's purely subjective. What sounds clashy to me might sound sick to you. And like some people make music that is very like wonky clashed out swings on purpose, a la Jay Dilla, K Trinata, whatever, you know what I mean? So experiment a little bit. I think for a lot of like straight up house and techno stuff, it's good to have things more matchy matchy, but it's up to you. Cha cha real smooth. <laughs> um, slide to the left. Um, do you end up applying all the groove to the same tracks then to make it consistent? Like I said, experiment with it, you know, move things around, get it to sound a little weird. If it, if you don't take a risk on making it sound kind of bad, you're probably never, you might not make it sound really good. You know, um, so don't be scared to like just do something that's like sounds a little fucked because maybe it, it'll accidentally be really sick, you know. Um, do you ever use the triplet feature when building out my MIDI clip instead of using the groove pools? I don't usually use triplet grooves that much in dance music like this. Um, sometimes, uh, I would, I personally lean more towards adjusting the midi by hand when i'm swinging it so like i just know the feel if i know the feel that i wanted to have in my head i'll just sit there and nudge shit around until it feels like how i'm thinking sometimes the feel that i have in my head is mpc swing at 62 and i just whack it on and it sounds exactly like what i'm imagining so like just you know try shit if you like using the triplets you know if you like it i love it um it's all about the groove. Da, 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 da. How did you apply the groove from the groove pool? It's drag and drop. So once it's once you've dragged one from this list, it'll show up in the pool down here. Once it's in the pool down here, you can drag it onto whatever. You know. Um, velocity up and down for volume, swing left and right for non-machine sound. Exactly for timing adjustments, right? It's like making the timing have a little bit more of a humanized feel. Um, when I'm making a song that is less melodic and more of a drum and bass song, uh, what do you do differently with your drums? Will you talk about writing bass lines as well? 
Writing baselines is a little bit outside of the purview of what I wanted to get through in this lecture. I will say drum and bass particularly, and many styles of dance music are not swung at all. If you're making electro, if you're making drum and bass, you're probably not really going to apply very much swing to your drums. That Those styles are going to be much more about call and response kind of ideas and volume interplays between different elements to make things funky. Like if you listen to drum and bass, those like little shuffly snares in the middle of the bar are so much quieter than the big snares on two and four, for example. Right? So like that interplay between loud and quiet is what makes it funky, not the fact that it has swung, usually. Um, no Joe Strummer type beats. Glad I wasn't the only one hearing 12. God, I got to listen to this song, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know it. Whack it on. Um, better than whack it off. That's what I always say. Um, don't be afraid to do something fuck because it might actually be really sick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Got through everyone's comments. Um, all right. Let's just talk about like a little baby sound design stuff on drums and uh i'll show you some options that are available to you inside of your uh you know without sort of breaking justin's uh uh structures of we're using nine and nines this weekend and then um maybe i can show you a little sketch that i made right before class that i feel like probably conforms the idea of the nine and nine challenge and then you can do a q a so real quick um some of this stuff you may have already seen me do. I know Justin gives you his own 909 rack, I'm pretty sure, to work with. But um, anyways, I'm just going to show you some shit. So there's a few parameters that I've, are very important to me when it comes to making drums that feel really good in your body. So one is the pitch of the drums. So inside of this drum rack here, I'm going to solo the bass drum. You have this little box boxy icon here thing to click where you can open up the actual sampler and see parameters of the sampler to mess with now if you're very new to ableton and or averse to any of the technical stuff feel free to tune this bit out because i really want you to just focus on the musical things more but for anybody who like wants to dig into it a little bit more i'll show you i am very specific about the tuning of my drum so i'll transpose everything kicks snares, whatever, until it grooves with itself. I'm not obsessed with it being in tune per se. I'm obsessed with it all feeling like it gels nicely. So, right, changing the pitch of the kick drum. Let's uh, add the low tom into the mix. Maybe I should just mute it instead here. That's cool. I think that has a nice pitch relationship. Maybe I'll like, filter down the low tom a little bit. So here's another parameter that I like to play with. Besides the pitch, which you get to in the controls tab, so there's sample, controls, transpose. So we could transpose the tom up and down. Sounds kind of sick when it's really low. It's like super dirty, almost not tonal anymore. Ugh, nasty. I might filter it, take some of the high end out of it. That sounds almost more like a bass synth type type shit. Um, I'm going to go through a bunch of things really quickly that I might do, and y'all can watch the recording back. I don't think I want to spend a ton of time talking sound design stuff, but maybe I'll add a little bit of resonance and like a pluck to this and really turn it into like a synth kind of sound. Now, now that our low tom is pitched down, I want to also pitch down our high tom a lot. The mid. And now the high tom too. Cool. Another thing I pay a lot of attention to is the length of the drum sounds. So how different does this hi-hat feel short? versus long. I kind of like it tight in this case, so shorter 
and maybe let's pitch it down as well. I find that when a bunch of things are pitched down, it starts to take on this like really crusty kind of old school quality that I like, but you know, it's very genre dependent. Like I think for garagey stuff, like somebody mentioned it pitched up oftentimes is better. Just experiment a little bit, have fun. Okay, this clap. Maybe we'll filter the clap a little bit. Just take off some of the high end so you can hear if I turn this filter off. Really bright, very in your face. If I turn the filter on, it sounds a little more dusty and like dropped back in the mix. Cool, I like that. Maybe we can um, make that clap a little weirder. So this is another thing that I wanted to show you guys is even within the parameters of the 909 challenge, you can still get a lot of different sounds from these drums by playing with the pitch, playing with the length, playing with the filters, and you can even drop an effect onto them, like onto individual drums in the drum rack. So I'll show you what I mean. So like, here's this hand clap cell that's been selected right here. If I go into, let's say audio effects, and maybe I'll grab a phaser flanger, I'll drop it onto the hi-hat. I'm just gonna grab this setting, whack up the feedback a little bit, turn it down some. So the solo this clap, now you can hear what this is doing. It's pretty cool, I dig that. Now I'm starting to get a slightly more kind of custom flavor to my drum sounds. And here, let me just show you one more time how I did that. So, well, actually there's two ways you could do this. The way that I just did it is I took an audio effect, I dragged it directly onto that cell of the drum rack. You guys see where my cursor is right here, the hand clap cell. When I drop that plugin onto that cell of the drum rack, it's just affecting the hand clap and not the rest of the drums, which is pretty cool. So now I can start to like dial in this cool kind of custom doubled weird wishy effect for my hand clap maybe i want to do the same thing with the uh hi-hat but maybe i want to put a reverb on it let's try that so i just again dragged from here and i put a reverb on the hi-hat channel yeah now we're starting to get kind of more interesting sounds maybe then i'll take a saturator and i'm just gonna blast the hell out of the whole kit let me turn this down so i don't blow your ears out Maybe on these hi-hats, I want to go phaser again. Let's see. Nice. Uh, <laughs> cool. Yeah, so not... Uh, the purpose of this three-day workshop is to get y'all experimenting with the 909, writing songs. But think about all the thousands of thousands of thousands of dance tracks that use the 909 and how different they can sound. And then start to think about that as how many different ways there are to create variation in your drums without really doing anything crazy. I'm not going for other samples. I'm not layering i'm not i'm i'm not doing anything other than i'm playing with the tuning i'm playing with some filters maybe i'm dropping an effect onto onto one of the drum sounds you know what i mean but like be very choosy about this not every sound needs to have a bunch of effects on it in fact probably you only need like one really affected sound in your song to suddenly give that piece of music a very interesting identity um so yeah um 
trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, you know, I said I would show you guys. I feel like realistically, this is more often what I do with um, when I'm doing these kind of affected sounds, right? Like, um, so more often than not, if I've programmed the whole drum kit like this in one track, but I want to start kind of messing around with different sounds for the like different effects for the different sounds, what I'll probably do is like duplicate the drum rack, then I'll go through and like, let's say I'm going to delete everything that's not this hi hat. Delete, delete, then I'll like go up to this one and I'll delete all these hi hats, right? So now I just have this hi hat separated. Oh, I forgot to take out the kick. My bad. That's an important one. Allegedly. Um, cool. So now I have that hi hat by itself, and now I can fucking go to town with, you know, whatever. Another phaser. Phasers all day today. <laughs> right? But that's, it's separated, it's on its own. I find it to be a little bit easier sometimes to conceptualize what I'm doing with the effects and stuff when it's on its own track. The other option and the quick option, if you don't like having a lot of tracks in your session, just keep it all in the drum rack, drag the effect onto individual cells. Make sense? Making one piece of drums more memorable. Another day of how simplicity is key. Um, Can't you pull the individual tracks out of the group? Yes, yeah. I, do it all the time. Um, in fact, most mostly I program my drums one at a time, to be honest with you. I'll like do a kick drum and then I'll make a new track and then I'll like do the toms and then I'll make another track and I'll do I find that to be easier. Whatever is easier for you, that's that's great. Uh, hit me with those phaser beams. How do you make your drum kit sound like modular rigs? Um, interesting question. I think it depends what kind of modular you're talking about, but um synthesized drums like what you can do with a modular you can just find i honestly my my best advice would be find samples of a modular and then use that as your drums um i can it, dm me and i can tell you more complicated ways to like sound design to make things sound more like that if you want to um okay wouldn't that be too heavy on the CPU because there's so many intra instruments? Usually not. I would say Ableton stock stuff runs pretty light. And I'm not talking about hundreds and hundreds of tracks. Like uh, a very built out song for me would be 16 to 24 tracks maybe. And that would be like a bunch of drums and basses and synths and whatever. Like I rarely get over that many. If I am having more than that I'm probably doing too much is usually my feelings on that and like you'd be surprised how powerful uh computers are now I mean if we're just talking about like one track that's just like one hi-hat and a, a couple plugins on it like you'll be fine um yeah okay so all right let me take a sec I don't know. I hope this is relevant to what we did today, but I wanted to try a 909 challenge kind of beat. So I made this uh, before class today. Um, I hope it still sounds cool. We'll see. Let me expand stuff. Um, and I'll tell you what's going on. I have drums up top, a bass right here. I got uh, an organ and vocals. This This might take me outside of the realm of 909 challenge, but I don't know. I was feeling myself. I also will say I haven't made like really housey house music like this in a very long time. I don't really make too much house like straight up like this for myself anymore. So like this was really fun for me.
That's enough of that. It took me, I don't know, spent, yeah, 2010 UK's house. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, spent about 20 minutes on that before class, but I do feel like it shows some of the stuff that we're talking about this whole weekend, right? Like a simple vocal chop. Would I spend more time on that vocal if, yeah, maybe. I feel like some of the notes are a little out of tune. Does it make it sound kind of old school that it's a little out of tune? Probably. Um, you know, I think this um, shows a bit of call and response here with some of these ideas of like, you know, let's see if I can find one. Like, okay, the vocal is going to play and then we're going to have a little snare drum idea. And then the vocal is going to play. Or right, here, let's just do this as a little. Be simpler this way. I'll even make this a little simpler for us. You guys hear that? So it's like vocal all night. All night. Right? There's a bit of a call and response happening there. I also feel like you could kind of call, I don't know, of maybe some people who are like really good music theory people would tell me that this isn't really a call and response, more of just like an A and a B. I don't know, but I feel like I hear this bass line as kind of having one too, the way that there's like these two different parts to it that are alternating. Like when it lands on that A flat, that to me sounds like it's like replying to like whatever happened before it. I don't know, whatever. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else. Oh yeah, there's a little sound design. Like, I don't know if you can hear some of the stuff is a little like the hi-hats, like it is, I did start with the stock Ableton, you know, 909 stuff but i uh pitched down the hi-hats by seven and added a i'm big on my phaser flanger doubler today for some reason i don't know but adding a little bit of that weird like metallic color to it this closed hat sounds like it's very pitched down and really tight too it's like super short yeah minus 10. so here i can put it back on the default so the default is like much brighter and it doesn't fit with the how crusty the open hat sounds to me so so i pitch this down a lot yeah um and yeah obviously or maybe not obviously uh i should i should say there is plenty of swing on these drums too and on the bass line and on the organ if you can't hear that um there is a lot so here let me see. actually, let's straighten it all out. Let's see what that sounds like. None and none and drums and bass only. Not bad. This is funkier to me. Make sense? I think that's got basically everything that we talked about in an hour and a half in like a little, whatever, two minute sketch. Um, cool. Uh, are we gonna go into how I make an effective baseline? Unfortunately, that is not the, that's not part of the, this class right now. Um, uh, effective baseline, here's my biggest tip uh use one note make an interesting rhythm do that first 
one note bass line if you can make the rhythm funky it's going to be dope and then pick a couple notes in the bass line and change like a couple notes and that's you probably for a dance music bass line don't need more than like three notes in it tops and uh you know it depends what you're writing to if you're writing to chords or vocals or whatever but like honestly like make the rhythm feel good first and then go from there um crazy that dion never used effects or altered his drums you know i like yes but also no because if you hear how distorted those records are like i would argue that that's an effect the way that he ran the 909 super hot into his mixer and like heavily eq'd it and um and played with the gain to get that like crunchy like sort of sound that is so specific to a dion record like to me i would argue that that's an effect even though it's not like he didn't put like reverbs or delays or anything like that onto his drums you know when we're, we're starting in ableton everything that you're doing starts from a place that's so like precise and clear sounding where some of those old school guys, they're working with analog gear that inherently has like noise, distortion, character, like just a little bit more. So like, you don't have to, like you could use the stock 909s and write the sickest song and everyone's gonna love it because the most important thing is the songwriting. For me, I'm fascinated by um, the character and quality of different sounds. So I think that it's fun to like, start with something really clean like what we have in ableton and try to somehow degrade it and something more interesting any tips on arrangement and building tension um huh. yeah um take the kick out to make a breakdown have less drums in when you want it to be less energy put more drums in don't fill everything but like use more drums to make a step up in energy. Like, for example, even the difference between a closed hat and an open hat. Like, if I go like this here. Let me put my swing back on these patterns. Actually, I'll just drag it over here. Um, okay. So, if I switch this open hat to be closed, That's like, to me, we'll call that like dynamic level here, right? Five out of 10. If all I do is I switch that closed hat to an open hat for these next few bars, it just picked up in intensity a little bit, right? Now, if I take a ride symbol, which happens next and add it to that, even more, a step up in intensity right and so now i have these like three fairly distinctive levels of dynamics that i can move between while the loop is playing right so like fundamentally i'm my baseline isn't really changing the whole time um in this you know little sketch of an arrangement but these different drum pieces are coming in and out to like add energy and remove energy then when I want to sort of like create the feeling of like a pause or a breakdown. So here we're at like the highest dynamic intensity in the drums, right? Cool, take some stuff out. Now take the kick out. Now when you take the kick out, now that really feels like, okay, now we're, we're breaking or at least we're continuing to step the momentum down. Then you'll notice in my next section, which is my sort of like little mock-up of a breakdown and a build-up, I take everything out except for the clap. So that I feel like is the most tension built moment of it. And I didn't even have to like add anything to the song. It's just cause I removed all of the things that give it the most propulsion and all that size. Does that make sense to y'all? Strings also can be a good start. Like this, this kind of song, I feel like classically, like you would maybe put like a droning string here, but really I feel like in the context of what we're doing this weekend, which is like, yo, focus on 909 
and rhythm arranging. Like, see how far you can stretch it by just like, take the kick out, put the kick back in. Take these different drum elements out, put them back in. Build rhythm in order to tell your story, to create tension and release, right? Like when I wanted to start building back up a little bit from this moment, I added a hi-hat back in. So we're from here. And it's like, okay, shit, suddenly we're, we're up at another intensity level. Then we're going to the drop and we'll do the classic. And then I made the drums really big again, right? Added the ride. And like now we're dropped back at full, full speed, right? So, um, yeah, does that make sense as far as the tension building? You know, I don't know if Justin talked about drum rolls and stuff yesterday. I'm sure you guys have all heard stuff like that. Like you can do snare rolls, you could do clap, fills. You could really, you know, you could kind of do it with whatever element you want, but, um, use rhythms you know try not to think too much about adding strings risers symbol like too much big like production things and think about the way like how do how does my drum arranging affect the tension and release aspect of the song you know okay raw beautiful imperfections yeah it's interesting it's refreshing to use stock kits and make them sound exciting versus individual sounds hunting yeah Realistically, my process is a bit of both, um, but uh, I think for the purposes of what we're doing this weekend, see how far you can stretch the 9 and Could you please touch on ride programming and processing a little bit? I didn't do too much to it, honestly, I don't think. Let's check. Yeah, there's no effects on it. Yeah. I did pitch it up, it sounds like. Oh, no, I didn't. I just filtered it. I didn't want all that low gunk. Sometimes it's cool. Sometimes it's not. Um, and then all I'm doing is like velocity stuff, right? You can see the first note real quiet, the second note real loud. First note real quiet, second note real loud. It almost has the effect of like a side chain, like pumping. All right, so with the rest of the drum sound. Yeah, I mean, it's not that crazy. That's all I'm doing to it. I just like, maybe I played with this tune knob till I found a pitch that I liked. I filtered out a little bit of low end and then just the, the most important thing is the velocity programming, you know, um, and the length of the ride. Could you tell how to program cookies of percussion so it works towards the same groove with the other melodic elements, how to think about pitch length accents in it? What makes it sound incohesive and uh what to avoid what to focus on thank you it's a really complicated question i'm not sure that i have any single answer to it to be real with you i feel like for me this is like the least helpful answer and i'm so sorry that i'm about to say this but i just like go with what i'm hearing i just like there's i don't know that there is a right or wrong answer it's like what sounds right and wrong to you so i think wrong maybe would be like too busy too many elements playing at the same time maybe would sound like a bit of a auditory assault i think we might want to avoid that um like i think you want there to be space for the music to breathe a little bit but how dense or how um minimal your composition is is totally up to you um working towards the same groove it's really just a feeling in my body justin told me this once when we were probably about 18 or 19. um he said to me once he's like i know that my track is going in a direction that i really like when i can just solo like the kick and the clap and the bass and that makes me want to dance right i think that's true you could pick different elements you could be like kick hi-hat bass kick bass vocal whatever it is but like I feel like ideally from a songwriting composition standpoint, you should be able to just solo like two to three elements together in your song. And if they're working right, you'll know it in your body. Like you'll, 
this is movement based music like it's okay to get up and dance around your room like a crazy person like you know like i would encourage it actually because it's probably the single best test of whether what you're doing is working or not um so yeah cohesion i'm just looking for a groove like i don't want elements to step on each other too much um so if something is saying something in this space maybe i'll put something else in this space um and then cohesion like sonically i don't know i think that's a really complicated question but um my the best advice that i would give you is uh use reference tracks and try to copy people's drums you're not going to be able to do it at first like nobody is but it'll start to get you in the ballpark right of like these ideas of like well how did they make a group that sounds so cohesive why do their sounds work together really well you'll try to copy it you'll end up somewhere different and you'll end up with your own track that's honestly like so much of my music still to this day starts that way where i just hear something that inspires me i'm like i'm gonna try to make something like that and you can never you get closer and closer as you get better but you'll never be able to exactly recreate what they did so like it just starts to build up some of those like analytical tools of like being able to hear something and understand intuitively like why it works together the way it does i guess um i hope that was the answer to the question that you're asking here's everything you got stars in your eyes oh my god wow thank you i made that so long ago um did i use 909 for any of it i don't remember um are toms essential in 909 programming no I wouldn't say essential. I think it depends what else is in the track. Like in this song that we were just kind of listening to here, there are no toms because um, there's a bass line. And I didn't like, I feel like toms and the bass line would have sat in. Well, you know what? Let's see. Let's see if we can prove or disprove what I was about to say. Cool. So just bass and drums. Let's add some low toms. Like, that's cool. Here, let me duplicate it. I could maybe find a rhythm for it that's better, but immediately my ears are telling me that the tom and the bass are sitting in a very similar spot in the mix. And they're kind of stepping on each other. And in my mind, I'm like, this is a one or the other type of situation. I don't need the, the low tonal stuff from the drums because my bass is already filling that space. If you're not gonna have a bass line, I think toms are one of the best ways to go as far as um, making like a track have a really full and really groovy low end. Um, yeah, best piece of advice about DJing production is rely as much as possible on just listening. It's so true. Um, just because you're doing all the technical things visually right does not mean it'll sound 100% good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Visuals are there to be an aid. For the longest time, I was very like anti, like don't use them. I find them helpful for certain things now, but like just trust your ears, trust your intu intuition, you know, yeah. Um, how do you solo more than one track? Okay, there are different solo settings. Um, I'm on a Mac right now, by the way, for the record, but um, if you hold down commands, command will solo more than one. If I let go of command, then solo, the way that I have my Ableton preferences set, solo is like one or the other. You can set it so that you have an additive solo, um, which is in somewhere in here in these preferences. But um, yeah, command and then click the solo button. We'll add them together. Um, how important is it to you to work and finish an arrangement quickly? What are some workflow tips that you recommend? Setting time limits helps. That is true. Um, I don't time myself too often anymore, but um, I think it's really helpful for a lot of people. I do think it's important to work quickly to an extent um, because there are certain um it it's just hard to listen to the same track over and over again and maintain any kind of like objective ear for like what's working really well or not so um pay attention to that that's like a big tip that i would give you if you're getting tired of hearing the loop like take a break take a walk touch some grass go outside make a different loop for a sec like come back to it you know um 
working quickly i feel like for me this is really different for everybody justin is a big like work super quick kind of person i think that for me to get to something that i consider like finished sounding takes me like maybe a little bit more time but i think it's kind of where do i work quickly and where do i take more time i actually take a bit of time making the loops and what i'll do usually is i'll without sketching out any kind of an arrangement, I'll just make like three or four different loops. I kind of did it here in this one. Like I have like, maybe this is one loop. Um, let me find one. Oh, with the vocal line. So like one loop would be open hat, this vocal. A different loop would be like, ride symbol and this vocal right and then another loop maybe we'll go back to the original vocal we'll keep the ride and then we'll add the organ something like that so what i'll be doing is like oh, here let me just take these aside as an example is i'll literally like without even thinking about this as an arrangement yeah i'll just like start sketching like some different loops kind of like this and i might spend a little while on these loops an hour two hours like if something isn't really working for me within a couple of hours of spending on it it's probably trash and i just scrap it and start something new but um i'll spend a while getting these to have something that's really interesting about them to me and to like have cool dynamics and they may grow they may turn into like eight and 16 bar loops that have a little bit of automation and whatever and like i'll spend a while on those because i find that if i have like three good loops to move back and forth between some two to four good loops to go back and forth between my arrangement is basically done then the process of actually like arranging it like left to right into a song once I have a few good loops, that'll take me 30 minutes, maybe, you know what I mean? Because like the material is good already and it's like it feels good to go back and forth between all these different loops. So like it's going to be easy to just roll this out into an arrangement. So that's where like I go a little slower when I'm writing and then I go fast when I'm like arranging it. And yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, just 99 kicks are used in everything. That is true in a lot of things, for sure. Control for the win. Ear fatigue can kill it. Yeah, mixing makes me hate my, my tracks. Yeah, I mean, mixing doesn't have to be so complicated. And I think it's good to analyze where pressure points are in your production process and, like, try to be like, okay, well, that's the part where I need to develop some workflow to, like, move through it really quickly, you know? Um, for me, I actually enjoy mixing. I do a lot of it for work, so I don't mind spending a while mixing something. Um, but for some people, they really hate it and they've just made like a really sick workflow for them to get their track sounding how they want in an hour so that they don't have to pull their hair out. And if that's your bag, then that's great. Um, does call and response happen every other bar or within the same bar? Um, it depends. It can happen within the same bar. It can happen every other bar. It can happen three bars and then the response happens in the last bar. It can happen two bars, the response happens in the third bar, and then the fourth bar is the call again. It's kind of up to you. I feel like it just whatever makes sense to you musically. I showed a couple examples of this at the beginning. Um, I know not everybody was in here from the very beginning, so I can do it again really quick. But um, here, let's just do... Just gonna grab this kit and I wonder if I remember the same same pattern. I think I do. It was like this. Cool. So here's a little call, right? A little one bar loop. No response to it yet. Right? If I duplicate this and now in the second bar, I go you know, like this. Now we have a call and we have a response. Cool, we could also do it where 
I just duplicated again, so now we have four bars. It could be call, call, call response. Right? Are you seeing how that's, that's working? Cool, okay, sweet. Yeah, so it really depends. I feel like, like it's not totally genre dependent, but like techno-y stuff, the loops are shorter two beat loops or one bar loops where you might have some call and response happening in the same bar that totally works in that style of music other styles of music your call and response may be over a course of many bars and it just kind of it's up to you to find that that's part of you writing your group you know um okay um you have consistent you'll come up with your own flow that's true use a reference track try to recreate that track with your own style that's what i love doing me too um it's the best for all tracks and a lot of percussive whoa that just jumps where did that go okay um to follow the same swing for tight groove sometimes um yeah i mean consistency is good consistency can be a little boring i would say experiment with having everything that's the same and maybe one thing that's a little different or you know, everything is just like a tiny microscopic little bit different. Maybe that's going to be the feel. Um, uh, do you work in a layered process? Like you give the full song one pass to make the entire arrangement with the loops you made, listen through it, come back to it and continue to layer and refine. I don't, uh, I don't usually have to add layers to it when I come back to it. Usually everything that's going to be in the song for the most part is written in my loop phase. Every once in a while, I'll get like two minutes, three minutes into building my arrangement and realize that something new needs to happen, that I didn't actually write enough loops to make it through or whatever the case may be. In that case, I will go back in my brain to like loop mode and I'll just like make a new idea. And I'll just like write a new thing that's gonna be for that section. And then I'll just keep rolling out the arrangement. But it's not like that layered of a process as in like, I kind of just like write everything. I make a few loops. I'm like, cool. These feel good when they bounce back and forth together. This one that I did here, this actually kind of feels like an intro. So like, let's start the song here. This one feels like a drop. So like, we'll put that, this is gonna be our first arrival point. This one is like a development on that. So maybe that's the second drop. And then I'm just gonna start to, to roll it out. And usually I don't have to go back and add more. My process of circling back to it is to maybe add a little bit more detail, which doesn't usually mean adding more. It usually means fucking with the sounds that are already in there to do something slightly different with them as the arrangement is going and then mixing. I don't, I'll do a rough mix. I like to, in one sitting, I should be able to have a full track written, arranged and rough mixed. Like that's for me what I'm going for because I find it much harder to come back into a song that's like, 40% done and still have that same spark of inspiration. So if I'm feeling it, I'll trace that thread all the way, start to finish, and then come back and do like the actual mix of it later. But sometimes not even that. Sometimes it sounds sick and I'm like, great, it's done. Have you seen Oppenheimer? Uh, random, but yes, I have. Uh, what's, a, what's an example of call and response in trance? I mean, it's all over the place. I think you just go in there and listen for ways that different acid lines can play off each other, a way that a bass line can bounce into another synth. Like it's, it's everywhere in every style of music, especially if you take like a really broad view of what the idea of call and response is. It's just good songwriting. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about folk or trance, like it's just, it's in there, you know? Um, so yeah, now like go in and pay attention to find those things in drums, in vocal arrangements, in synth arrangements, in funk bands, jazz bands, classical music, like whatever. It's it's all over. Um, I feel like my rides always sound so tinny and pitchy. Your sound clean in this track, yo. It's just the stock one. Um, lower, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I just messed with the with the pitch a little bit and like filtered it a little bit. And then you got to get the volume right. I think that's really key for drum. Like sometimes when people are like, it sounds so thin, it's just because your bright elements are too loud. Um, you know, and if you turn them down, then 
it doesn't sound so thin anymore and it just sits in the mix a little bit better um how to make drums glued so that the percussion is not so dynamic and takes so much of this when you program drums do i think about filling the frequency spectrum um really good question sort of a slightly more advanced technical question um so i feel like uh glue is a lot about uh the groove like the rhythm and the choice of sounds as much as it is about any like processing that you would do after the fact so like yeah like you can compress and saturate drums to squeeze them together and i do that on almost every song that i make like yes i'm trying to like sonically glue the drums together but i feel like it has to feel glued together before i do any of that like it has to feel like it's one kit and the main thing besides the rhythm and the choice of samples is the volume relationship between things if shit is sticking out turn it down or filter it or pitch it down or do something to make it not stick out so much like there's no reason to go and compress your whole drum group because a couple elements are too loud like just turn them down you know it's like it's crazy how much volume is like just the most powerful thing in music production period hands down everything is volume eq is volume compression is volume saturation is volume panning is volume is all different ways of manipulating volume and it's all like that's and literally everything in audio production and like yeah getting that relationship so that everything just like sits together and glues together to me is part of like programming the group as far as your thoughts about frequency spectrum is very important to me i don't think about like filling the frequency spectrum i think about with drums specifically unless i was making a track that is like a purely percussion track if i was doing like dj plead type shit sure i'll fill the whole frequency spectrum with drums that'll probably sound banging but um usually i'm trying to make all of the elements fit together and each have their own place in the frequency spectrum so like the kick's going to be here the bass might live a little below and a little above it then we'll have some of the mid-range like the vocals then like snares and claps then really high stuff high hats whatever so like i definitely do think about where all of these elements are going to sit and I try to make sure that if there are overlapping elements, that they're not fighting each other too much. So that comes back to volume relationship, choice of sounds, and rhythm programming. If you want your kick and your bass to be distinct from each other, don't make your bass play when the kick drum hits. Right? If it goes kick, bass, 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 kick, bass, 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 boom, boom, boom. Your kick and your bass are going to have all the space in the world to both be gigantic because they don't play at the same time. Easiest way to, to make things sound not cluttered is to write the song in a way that's not cluttered. You know, I think people like to jump ahead to the like, like, oh, I got to like carve out space for this and that and like make sure things are sitting in. But like, if you listen to tracks that sound fucking huge, usually it's because they wrote the song in a way for everything to take up as much space as it wants. Nothing is fighting with anything else because they wrote it that way. Um, and that's why, that's how I like to think about it first. Um, can we go through an example track drums of yours? Yeah, we could try. I'm on my laptop right now. I don't, um, I don't know what I have on here and what uh, plugins are gonna open or not open when we try to pull it up, but we could do that. What do you use splice for? Do you layer? already made drum loops that you'd like i do i will work with loops yeah for sure um usually for me uh drum programming involves like some combination of a lot of the things that we're talking about here like maybe there's some sock sounds from ableton some samples that i've picked like just one shot samples from my sample library and maybe like a loop or two kind of like buried in there or tucked in there loops are great for getting your writing going um for like, you know, you need to just establish a groove real quick so you can start to like actually write something so you're not starting from a completely blank camp canvas. I think loops are sick for that. Um, and then you just build around it and build on top of it. And sometimes the first thing that you started with ends up coming out and then it sounds better, you know, uh, happens to me all the time. 
I don't really use Splice that much, I'll be honest with you. Um, I have an account. I'm very scared of things that are, make me sound too much like other people's things. So I don't use Splice that much. I just have like a really big sample library that I've built up over many, many, many years from artist sample packs, people that I used to work for and work with, sharing samples with them and them sharing samples with me, things that I've recorded on my own. You know, um, I think Splice is fucking awesome. I would definitely encourage people to use it. I think in the context of what we're doing here this weekend, the idea is like, don't think too hard or too much about drum sounds and texture and you know those kind of things is more of the cherry on top because if you can write good rhythms write good songs you can just use the most basic like kit and the thing is especially for anybody who's more towards the beginner to early intermediate side of producing it's going to make your track sound more cohesive so just use a 808 use a 909 use a 707 because it's like a language unto itself already instead of sticking all these disparate pieces together that might sound disjointed it's a real easy shorthand to get your tracks to already sound like a cohesive track to just use a drum kit that is like tried and true anyways um when working with breaks uh how do you complement them with the midi drum rack thinking jungle breaks specifically it's a good question um I don't know that I have a single answer to it. I feel like it's kind of like, what do I need from the breakbeat? Like, if you want to talk old school, like proper 90s jungle, I don't think they were really supplementing those breaks that much. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, if we're thinking frequency spectrum low to high, the drums are really like a lot more mid-range, right? They don't go that low. And the low, low stuff is all just the subs and the eight big 808 basses and the you know, whatever, Reese's and stuff. If we're talking like a more modern, like D&B kind of context, obviously like the drums are much punchier and they do go much lower. And I think it just depends how much of like a true to life breakbeat sound you want. If that's the case, I'm gonna, my main focus is beefing up the areas of the frequency spectrum that need more size and punch, but I need to find a sound that sounds like it's part of the rest of the kit. I'm looking for something that it's like, it doesn't sound too different. Like it sounds like it could be part of the on the break or the think break. It just goes lower and is punchier. If we're talking about, you know, I don't know, whatever. I, hopefully that's helpful. Um, uh, where do you get your vocals from? Do you sell my sample? Do I sell my sample packs? No, I do not. Maybe I should. Um, where do I get my vocals from? I have a big folder of acapellas. I'll show you. Uh, sounds and everyone else knows bullshit. Um, here it's acapellas, and I just have tons and tons and tons of them. Okay, I'll just go in there and look for ones. It's mostly like old records and stuff. Um, yeah, uh, you know, go buy vinyl or use soul seeker well i don't know whatever get your acapellas like uh how people do oh use the ai song splitters i don't know i think the whole uh when and how to sample issue is is tricky but i think just make music have fun it's like everyone is sampling literally from the top of the industry all the way down like don't let it stop you you know go split someone's song take the vocal figure out what how the licensing works and you know whether you want to release it later after you've made the thing um would i prefer making my own samples no I, it's not that i prefer making them it's that i just have a lot already and i've curated them over deck like a decade and a half now so like it's my it's my library you know what i mean like i know where everything is I know the sounds that I like if I'm making different styles of music. If I want X, I'm going to go to folder Y. If I want Z, I'm going to go to folder A. You know what I mean? Like, I just know where everything is. It's, and they're sounds that I've used over and over again. So I've built a bit of like a language and a universe around my own music and my own productions for like sounds that I like. And that's part of you building up the sounds that you like. I think the danger with Splice is that 
every song that you make, you just go to Spice and you get a whole new bunch of samples. And it's like, where's the through line in your music? You know what I mean? Not the worst thing to do when you're starting out. Everyone needs to experiment and like find their sound. But, um, you know, for me at this point, like I've just been collecting sounds and making them for so long that I have gigabytes and gigabytes of them on my lap. It's enough sounds to last me the rest of my life. If I can't make music with that much sound, I'm doing something wrong. So like, you know, um, especially once you're able to manipulate them and fuck with it in ways that you like, then I know I've established my own little sonic universe that I live in. And that's why I don't use Splice that much, if that makes sense. Um, Acapella is for you. What do you use to make bootlegs? I haven't made a bootleg in probably like five years, honestly. It's been a long time. But um, if it's like true bootleg bootleg, um, I just like rip the song, download an MP3 of it, and then just start putting some drums on top of it and see where it goes. Maybe use a song splitter if I really want to program around just the acapella or like just the bass or whatever. But um, yeah, key takeaways, everything is volume, go by, uh, <laughs> everything is volume, write good rhythms, uh, um, right? Velocity is volume, emphasis patterns are volume, uh, rhythms are rhythms, so like good call and response, compelling uh, songwriting, uh, swing, that kind of stuff, you know? Uh, go buy vinyl, because buying vinyl is a good thing to do, but for the purposes of your music making, you don't need vinyl. You don't need anything. You just need to fuck around with Ableton. Um, tips on curating your sample collection. I feel like I have way too much. Spend some time with uh, making favorite. Like, okay, I think everybody, when you're creating a lot of music, you go through periods of being really inspired. And then you go through periods of being less inspired. When you're less inspired is the best time to like fix up your studio build that keyboard stand that's been sitting in the corner unassembled for a while uh organize your sample library you know what i mean um just like over the holidays if you're like damn i'm tired i'm burned out that was such a long year that's like the ideal time to be like you know i'm not going to make music right now but i'm going to go through and make folders of my favorite shit stuff that i've used in tracks before like sample yourself recycle yourself Go back into your favorite tracks that you've ever made and you're like, oh, all the drums seem to be from this one pack. Great. Find that pack, set it aside. Like go through and spend a little bit of time doing the work to like get it organized in a way where like all your favorites are in easy access. Cause like you truly don't have to reinvent the wheel ground up with everything for every song that you make. Like if you use the same kick and a bunch of other drums for like a year, it's probably just going to mean your music sounds super cohesive for a year. And like you're writing other things on top of it and different rhythms and different melodies and whatever. And then like next year, like I got bored of that kick drum. Find a, a new kick drum. You know what I mean? Like um, you don't need, yeah. Just uh, go pick some favorites. Actually, uh, one more thing on that note. Um, you don't have to do this at all, but uh, Martin, uh, who I mentioned earlier in the class, has this system where he makes like what he calls a working folder for himself every month. Martin will take things that he's recorded from his synths, recorded off of his vinyl, field recordings that he's gotten on his phone when he's out and about, plus some of his favorite samples that he's found on his hard drives for the last couple of months. And he'll just like put that into a folder, which is his, you know, December, 2024 working folder. He will make music with the sounds that are in that folder for a month, right? Then when it comes time to hit the next month or when he's rinsed that folder out, We'll make a new working folder and just add some stuff. So there's there's different systems and different ways to like deal with the clutter of having a billion samples. But I think, yeah. Um, yeah, I think does this sample spark joy? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Marie Kondo, that shit. Um, okay, wait, hold on. Volume is life. Air splitters are fire these days. Um, Create more create and experiment less copy from splice yeah yeah i think a combination you know a little bit of copy from splice is fine everybody does it but experiments on top and with it um do you have some entrance tips or resources 
Um, some people have mentioned this before. I think a really powerful thing to do in the beginning, take a track that you like, that you've downloaded. It's in your DJ, you know, your record box library. Put it into Ableton. Match the tempo of your session to the tempo of that audio file so that everything lines up. Then go through and mark out different sections of the structure. So here, we can do this a little bit right now. We're getting well away from the kind of stuff that I thought we were going to be talking about today, but fuck it. Um, my computer is real slow right now, too. And my apologies, everyone. Um, this laptop is getting old. What am I doing? Okay, music, DJ, this list. Um, let's go. Let's get this up basic track because this is a banger. Okay, mute all this bullshit that I made and let's listen to some good music. Okay, so first things first, I'll line up the downbeat right here. Then I gotta figure out what BPM this is. So how much did I just cut out? I think that was two bars. Great, that's two bars. So now I'm gonna drag this until that lines up with two bars. Unsurprisingly, this is going to be right around 140, is my guess. Okay, so now I got it lined up, right? Should still be on. Cool. Um, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna literally, let's drag this to the top so we can see what we're doing. Oops, oopsie. Um, I'm gonna call this reference. Now I'm gonna make some markers. So we can call this intro. We can call this uh, intro develop. We can call this first drop, right? Can go through, probably something happens at 49. Let's see. Okay, so this is hats and now little mini break and then second drop maybe i'll call this something different maybe more useful is like synth start right you, you um, I forget who asked this question, but do you see what I'm, uh, Yana, do you see what I'm doing here um, to mark out the structure of this reference track? I could keep going with this, right? But um, other tips based off of this, notice how nicely this lines up with the main groove mark or not groove the main grid markers in ableton most things are happening in 16 bar increments in this track right first drop then 16 bars later the hats come in little mini break just to set up then 16 bars after the hats come in the synths start probably at 81 something else is going to happen then you can see another little mini break then something else happens at 97 then we have a breakdown right you can see how even we space everything is that's most dance music will stick to that convention. It makes it easier to mix. It makes it more hypnotic on the dance floor because you're not being pulled out of it by odd numbers of bars. Like everybody can basically count to four and do it four times. It's easy to follow along with and uh, is very functional in that way. Um, so, um, oh wait, sorry. I read the wrong person's comment. Hold on, who said, oh, how do you work with grid lines as you're zooming in and out? I find I get confused as the grids and bars change. Um, I feel like I have, oh wait, this was Tony. Tony G, do you have song arrangement tips or resources? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, this is what I would do. Do this, make a structure, then when you have your own song that follows the structure that you've just mapped out by following a reference track, 
as you do this over and over again inside of Ableton, you will start to get a really solid understanding of some of the conventions of these dance music structures and the way that like first drop at bar 33 around a minute is like so many of the songs that are on my library, you know, the drop developing after 16 bars super common as well like it just they'll all start to you'll start to internalize it and you won't have to think about it as much when you're doing it. Um, okay how do you work with grid lines as you're zooming in and out i find i get confused with bars as the grid lines change it's a good question i don't really have a great answer for you unfortunately i just know like this is one bar the way i can tell that is because the first number always says one so one 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 two one three one four then the second bar starts at two 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 three two four each one of those is a quarter note, right? So that's like one beat. Every, each one of those quarter notes is divided into four. So I just know that when I'm seeing four ticks in between two and two, two, that I'm looking at a 16th note. I don't really know how else to explain it other than um, that. What you could do is you could fix your grid. If you don't like it changing, you can take it off of this adaptive grid setting and you can just put it on like eighth note. And then it's always gonna be on eighth note, no matter how much you zoom in or out. If that is better for you, I would say do that. Uh, I prefer the adaptive grid because it gives you a finer amount of control as you zoom in, but um, it definitely takes some getting used to. So yeah, I hope that helps. Command one, command two, change the grid size. That can help too. You still, I feel like, have to know what you're looking at and just being able to understand like quarter 16th, eighth, quarter eighth, 16th, excuse me, um, like in reference to the grid lines is very helpful. But yeah, you gotta add to this by cutting sections up at change points and make the sections different colors. Yeah, that's great advice on the reference track. Yeah, totally. I use FL Studio, fairly fluent with it. However, I downloaded Ableton in order to participate. I couldn't figure out how to add sounds to the template and gave up. Do it in FL. Get a 909 NFL and do your thing in there. I don't think like, I mean, Ableton's cool. It's not the only DAW to make music in. Make music in the one you're comfortable with it. Stick in the confines of the challenge though. That's all I'd say. Just do the 909 challenge. I'm sure that FL has a 909 kit. Or if not, just go on Splice and download like the most bone stock 909 that you can find. Um, yeah. Yeah, just do, yeah, use whatever you got, you know, um, just make sure that you're, you're staying within the challenge. All right, I think on that note, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed that. I hope everybody got something from it. Um, and I uh, am not always the fastest to respond, but I will make myself available to people. If anybody wants to chat, just DM me. Um, I feel like I should also say, maybe Justin has introduced this, maybe he hasn't. Um, there is a, uh, a six week boot camp that's going to start on the 16th. And um, I will be leading hopefully two review sections for that boot camp. Um, so that means that each week of the boot camp, I'll sit down with a section of up to, but not more than 15 people. And we'll look at people's tracks. I'll have you send me tracks. I'll open them in Ableton and we'll talk about things that I would do. I'll give people notes. The idea is that everybody in the section will get their track reviewed in front of everybody else at least one time. Um, Justin will handle lectures once a week and he'll have a review section or two. And I will also have a couple review sections. These boot camps are really fun, really great way to connect with other producers build some community around what you're doing and some potential collaborators and things like that. And um, we'll get to have fun listening to people's music and giving feedback on it. And I can show you ways that I would tweak your arrangement, songwriting, production, etc. So if you enjoyed this session, um, I think Kate has just dropped some, you know, forms in the Zoom chat, and I'm sure that it'll be landing in your email later. So um, yeah, sign up if you are interested in doing something like that and diving in a little further. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of the holiday weekend. Have a good one.